Please be turning your Bibles this morning with me to James chapter 3. That will be the foundation for our discussion today. James chapter 3. It is a blessing to be with you, even though we do have some of our own, as has been mentioned, that are either traveling or not feeling well. We do also have some who are visiting with us, and we are very glad that you're here. Invite you to join us and worship with us anytime that you might have the opportunity. We are continuing our series from the book of James, and it has brought us to James, the third chapter. And while it is a familiar text, it is a potent, powerful text, it is a text that challenges all of us. And as we look within our own heart, in our own mind, when we read this text, if we're honest with ourselves, I doubt that there is anybody that would say, you know, I, have, I just don't have a problem with that. According to what James says, we all have a problem. Some of us may have more of a problem than others with the tongue, but it is not something that is easy to conquer, and it is something that we have to constantly strive to battle against and be careful about and consider and pray to the Lord about. In James 3, is a text that we'll be looking at this morning. When you think about the tongue, the tongue is a messenger. It is a messenger of the deepest portions of our heart and our mind and our soul. Nothing is more telling on the heart than the tongue. Now that's not to say that just because we don't express something, if we think it in our mind or heart, it's okay. But the tongue can betray us in a sense. The tongue can show what we are thinking, and sometimes even we feel shocked and surprised by what we may have said. Maybe we didn't really think about and realize how we were meditating on things or considering things or what our real perspective was. Maybe it was in a moment of of anger or frustration or difficulty or challenge of some sort, and all at once these things are revealed about our own heart that God knew, and now perhaps our friends and brethren know, and we know as well. Notice Luke chapter 6. It's interesting, as we're going to be looking at James 3, and I've mentioned this every time, but James is so much like the prophets, and so much like Jesus. Some of the same types of warnings and admonitions. We saw this We've seen this all the way through James, especially when you get into James chapters 2 and 3 and 4. Sometimes you feel like, well, I'm just hearing Jesus talk. And uh, it is based in Christ's teaching, of course, uh, that James would mention these things to us. But if you look at Luke chapter 6, verse 43, Jesus talks about the tree and its fruit and that sort of thing. He says, for there is no good tree which produces bad fruit, nor On the other hand, a bad tree which produces good fruit, for each tree is known by its own fruit. He says, For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush. The good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good. And the evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. And so really when we talk about the tongue or what we say or our words, it is a heart issue. And Jesus makes that clear to us in Luke 6. I want you to think also, James spends a lot of time in this little book of of James that we're studying talking about the connection with the heart and the tongue and our faith and our works and all sorts of things along that line. I want you to notice with me just, just quickly, and some of these we've already examined, but in, in James chapter 1, for instance, in verses 19 and 20, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. So there he's talking about how we hear and how we speak, We could go on and notice there in verse 26, if anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle or control his tongue or restrain his tongue, he deceives his own heart. This man's religion is is worthless. We come to chapter 2 and verse 12, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of, of liberty. And so there's a way not to speak, but there is also a way to speak, he says to us. But again, that focus on 
faith and faith in action and how that affects how we speak and how we think and how we would act. And that leads us on to James chapter 4. You'll look there again in James 4 and verse 11. Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother judges his brother, speaks against the law and judges the law. And then finally, James chapter 5 and in verse 12. But above all, brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with another oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no. And who couldn't think of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount when you read that? I just wanted you to see all the way through James. It's not all that James speaks of, but certainly he addresses it. So in the context of talking about faith and having a working faith and how we interact with one another and how we treat each other, this is something James brings up quite a bit. But there is no section in James, and I really don't know that there's a section in all of the New Testament that deals with it more thoroughly uh, than we have here in this, this one section in James 3, 1 through 12. And so that's really what we're going to be uh, looking at. Certainly fits with some of the warnings of the Old Testament prophets and of the Proverbs and of Jesus. And even in Romans chapter 3, when you look at Romans the third chapter as uh, the Apostle Paul there is speaking to us about the fact that we have, we have all gone away from God. Jesus is the only perfect one that we all are in need of the forgiveness and the mercy and the grace of God. And it is a string of quotations from Old Testament scripture. But notice this. He says, their throat is an open grave. And I want you to notice how he uses the different physical members of the body in a metaphorical way. Just like when he talks about us listening to God's word, sometimes he says their, their ears are dull of hearing. Well, that's really metaphorical for how they listen and why they listen the way that they do. But he says their throat is an open grave and with their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. And the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. He takes all these different, you know, physical members. He talks about our eyes and our, their throat and their tongues and their lips and their mouth and all that sort of thing, their feet. And he's saying just about every kind of action has been tainted in some way by sin. And that sin begins in the heart. So according to James, as we're going to look at this text, there's nothing more powerful in human interactions and relationships than the tongue. In fact, Solomon would say this. He says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18, verse 21. Proverbs 12, 18 says, the tongue of the wise brings healing. And so we don't have to use our words as weapons that would destroy and hurt and harm. We can use our words in a way that would bring healing and encouragement. And you really think about some of the greatest leaders we could ever imagine that were so skilled with speech, even in times of national despair, even in times of great tragedy, even when people were perhaps depressed and discouraged and disillusioned, fearful and scared. And sometimes they were very small speeches. Who could forget of men like Winston Churchill and others? Who, who knew how to, to move men and you could see strength and fortitude in their words and their words could be an encouragement to comfort and console and to motivate even when people felt broken. And with all of that said, with all of the good that can come from what we say and how we say it and the motivations in what we say, we also are fully cognizant of the fact that the tongue can be used as a great tool for satanic evil. It can be fixated on bitterness and hostility and harm and death and destruction. It can contribute to the already considerable pain and suffering of humanity. And just as the scorpion carries his poison in his formidable tail, the deceiver, the slanderer, the false accuser 
carries theirs in their tongue and in their words and in their speech. And they may appear altogether to be pleasant in personality, but their tongues can wreak havoc wherever they go, and it does not matter where they go. It seems like it's always going to be a lightning rod of difficulty. And so our tongues have the power to encourage. Think of the, the mother, if she could not speak, all the sound she introduces her new baby to. Think about the affectionate expressions of concern for others that come through the tongue, through our speech, through our words. Think about all of the oral teaching and proclamation of Jesus as Lord. How does that come? It comes through speech. It, it comes, we understand it's in the Word of God and we read it in the Word of God, but we're commanded to proclaim it and preach it and teach it. And so we're not saying, nor is James saying that we should solve this problem by just not talking at all. But he does, he does warn us in this brilliant section of literature and argumentation in its richness and in its power. And really, as we read James 3, having said all that, James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, I want to look at four compelling reasons why we must all strive to control the time. Four compelling reasons. There are, this is coming straight out of your Bible. This is going to come straight out of what James says as we look at this particular context. And, and the first thing I want to submit to you as we consider this is that James would say, listen, we need to control our tongue and strive to control our tongue and our speech because of the greatness of its potential to condemn. Because of the greatness of its potential to condemn. Just as I mentioned to you, it has great potential to do good. It, it also has the potential to condemn the one who misuses it. And, he, and we begin in chapter 3 and verse 1, and I really want to spend some time here in, in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, so we can understand it. But chapter 3 and verse 1, he says something that might even seem to be shocking to many of us. He says this, he says, let not many of you become teachers. I think the old King James says masters, and that's fine. The, the idea of masters, you know, if you think of a, a true teacher, the, especially if, you're, if you were a Jew and you think of a teacher, you might call that teacher what? Rabbi. And sometimes when they thought of rabbis, they thought of someone of, of authority and so someone of, of, of some influence. And so the old King James mentions, let not many of you be masters. It's talking about teachers. Let not many of you be teachers. He goes on to explain why. He says, my brethren, knowing that as such, we will incur a stricter judgment or condemnation. So we begin here in chapter 3 and verse 1 with a warning to those who would teach. Go on to verse 2. He said, For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. So first of all, we have this, this warning to those who desire to teach. And so I think at the very beginning here, we need to try to clarify in our minds, what is he saying? I mean, it almost seems odd or out of line. Don't we want people to teach? Wouldn't James want people to teach the Word of God? I mean, don't, don't we want people to be teaching, you know, in whatever capacity maybe that they're capable of, of teaching? And there's some sense in which all of us as Christians should be teachers on some level. Maybe we're not teaching in a public capacity, but we're still teachers. I do think he he has a special encouragement here for those who are teaching in a public capacity. But doesn't it seem odd to say, I mean, you're trying to encourage people to teach and say, hey, we don't want too many teachers, but that's exactly what James says. But there's a reason he says it, and we have to look at the context to be able to appreciate it. He's not condemning teaching. I mean, you could turn over to a number of passages. Ephesians chapter 4 speaks of the gift of those who would teach, those who would be evangelists. It speaks of pastors and teachers. The Lord wants and needs in his kingdom willing and gifted and trained and qualified teachers. He, but he is warning us. He's warning us about hurrying, if I said that right, or, or being too quick to push somebody into a role of teaching. And that happens sometimes. And maybe somebody hasn't thought about the seriousness of teaching and preaching. 
They have not thought about the solemn responsibility that it is. Maybe to them, you know, being a preacher is just about uh, people liking to hear you talk and the gift to gab, sometimes we call it. So just because somebody has the gift to gab doesn't mean that he needs to be a gospel preacher. Now, there are those who may be especially capable at speaking in a way that people can understand and that encourages them, but that person understands the solemn, serious responsibility in front of them, that they're responsible before God for teaching truth. And I think that is what James is saying, and James is also saying this. James is saying that the more we have the opportunity to speak, even the more we have the opportunity to do good with our tongue in the case of teaching or preaching, also the more opportunity we have to do ill. And so the more opportunity somebody has, let's say, to teach truth, the more opportunity he has to teach error. And so I think he's just trying to get across to us that Look, I'm not trying to discourage from having teachers, but let's not be rash in this. Teachers will be expressing their faith regularly. They have to strive to be cautious. And sometimes they may not, and I I heard a brother say a long time ago, and I certainly agree with it, he said, I don't know if I say anything right every time or everything right any time. And there's always that risk, and you do the best you can, and you realize you're fallible, but God's word is infallible. But I do think James is saying, let's take this seriously. God wants teachers, but, but we need to be sober. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 5, But you be sober in all things, and your hardship, do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And so the scope of damage is much greater if someone is teaching publicly. So the more we speak, the more cautious we need to be. But it's not only preachers, it's not only Uh, Bible class teachers, you may be in an area where you have influence with certain persons. The more people you have influence with, even the more cautious and the more careful that you may need to be. He mentions the idea of of teachers having stricter judgment. And somebody might say, wait, 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 wait. I thought we were all held to the same standard. We are. I'm not held to a different standard than, than you would be held to. We're all held to the Word of God. But it's a matter of opportunity, and I think that's what he's, he's trying to get across to us. And as I say that, I also want to say this, and that is this, this warning to those who teach regarding the tongue, that there has to be a, a, a balance there. Ephesians 4.15 talks about preaching the truth in love. And so there has to be love, there has to be transparency and fairness, and accountability, uh, but, but there also needs to be truth. And sometimes people th- say, well, you know, we're not, we're not going to worry about uh, addressing certain issues because, you know, James warns us about the tongue. It's almost an excuse for not speaking at all. But, you know, there's, there's times when we have to speak. Romans 16, 17 says to identify those who are divisive. In Matthew 18, in, in cases of personal offense, if If uh, you and I have a personal offense issue and we can't get it worked out, Lord willing, we can't get it worked out, but we we can't get it worked out, we may have to get somebody else to help us. And if that doesn't work, we may have to get the congregation involved. There are times where that occurs. You know, when you think about what Jesus spoke out, and he spoke out very bluntly in Matthew chapter 23 regarding uh, the Pharisees. In 2 Timothy 4 and 10 and 14 and 15, he talks about the fact that Demas has forsaken me. 3 John 9 and 10, John speaks of diatrophies. Galatians 5 and verse 12, uh, the apostle Paul spoke of those Judaizers. He said, I wish they'd mutilate themselves. That's pretty strong language. Somebody might say, is he misusing his tongue? But he wasn't misusing his tongue at all. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 1. Is there ever a time to speak about spiritual issues with brethren? There is. So we have to be clear in our mind. There is such a thing as gossip, and we'll speak to that in a moment. There is such a thing as slander. There is such a thing as backbiting. And a lot of this has to do with motives and speaking inappropriately versus appropriately. But I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 with me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says, you know, he encourages them to be united. But in verse 11, he says, for I have been informed concerning you. So Paul 
was informed concerning the brethren at Corinth by Chloe's people, Chloe's household, that there are quarrels among you. And he goes on to say, he speaks of those who might be following Paul and Apollos and Cephas and Christ, etc. But what happened? Well, the house of Chloe told Paul, hey, Paul, we've got some problems here at Corinth. In fact, when we read all of it, we find out they had a whole bunch of problems. I don't know how long the conversation was between them and Paul or the communication between them and Paul. Did the house of Chloe gossip? Did they slander? No. No, there, there was a time to have that conversation, in this case, so Paul could help the brethren at Corinth. And so let's say there's a congregation and uh, they're having great difficulty and there's a beloved uh, brother that can help and has relationship with that congregation and somebody were to say, you know, we've really been struggling with this issue or that issue, that's, that's not gossip necessarily. That's exactly what, and I understand you could say, well, Paul was an apostle, granted, but there's still a principle here. Not any conversations necessarily gossip or slander. But there are some conversations that are, and we are warned about our tongue. And so at the very beginning, we can see teachers, but all of us are warned, use the tongue appropriately and in the way that it ought to be and realize it has the potential to do damage if we're not careful. So we've noticed some cases here when speaking out is, isn't gossip. There's times when you can have a conversation and it's not gossip. It's not slander. But there are times when it is. Secondly, so number one, it has the potential to do great harm. Number two, and we're going to read verses two through five, control your tongue because it can control you. Let's read together James chapter 3 and verse 2. He says, For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man able to bridle the whole body as well. Now if we put the bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. Let's talk about uh, this section here a little bit. First of all, he says, controlling the tongue is a sign of spiritual maturity. Notice there in verse, uh, verse 2, he says, we all stumble in many ways. I think what he's saying is, hey, this is challenging for everybody. This is, this is a, a warfare, if you will, a battle for all of us. And so he says, we stumble in a lot of different ways, but if anybody doesn't stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man. I mean, if you have the discipline to get your tongue under control, then that's a sign of maturity. Now, having said that, I don't think he's saying, and I've had some people say before to me, well, he's saying you can never control the tongue. Well, that would be silly because he told us to control the tongue. He tells us all the way through James to control the tongue. So it's not that he's saying to us that we cannot control the tongue, but he's saying it will always be a battle. In other words, it requires vigilance on my part. It requires diligence on your part. And if we get out of the path, we may have to say, you know what, I, I slipped up there. I messed up there. I need to repent of that and try to do better. And all of us are going to go through those experiences. And so that, that's his, his emphasis that this is a, a potential danger. When we have texts that speak of us being raised up with Christ, it seems like the control of how we speak to each other and how we treat one another and having the Spirit of Christ is always at the very forefront. If a man can control his tongue, he can control his life, and therefore he can be mature in the Lord. And we see that in First and Second Timothy. We see that in, in Titus. It needs to be something very important. And all of us in our relationships, maybe in our marriages, maybe our friendships, maybe with brethren, uh, our, our filter wasn't really activated and we said something too quickly and too rashly, and we, and we think back and we go, you know what, that was the wrong way to be thinking. I, I certainly should have thought through that more. And I think that's what James is saying, is there's always that danger that we must address in our lives. 
But if you can control your tongue, look at verses 2 through 4. He says you can control your whole body. It's, it's be, because I think that the tongue can sin so quickly. You know, there's not some long, evolving process. Sin tends to work upon us being rash. But boy, when it comes to, you know, getting from here, you know, some of you may think, well, Bruce, getting from here to here is kind of slow for you. But, <laughs> but, but getting from the mind and saying it, and then wishing I hadn't said it, or wishing you hadn't said it, but you can't pull those words back in. It happens so very quickly. I think he's trying to say there's a serious danger there for all of us to have to address. It can, our tongue can sin more readily and easily, and so it's important for us to be diligent. The tongue, one has said, is the master switch on the circuit board of your spiritual life. The master switch on the circuit board of your spiritual life. Look at his illustrations. You know, we've been talking about James and how he, he uses these illustrations. James chapter 2, you know, he talks about the rich man and the poor man being in the assembly. And then in verses 14 through 26, on faith being active, he talks about the notion of, of the action of faith. And he says, somebody comes to your door and they kind of, you know, they knock on your door and, and, and they say, I, I need help. And you say, that's great. Be warm and filled. Hope everything works out for you. You slam the door in their face. What kind of faith is that? So he uses these illustrations. But notice the illustrations here in James chapter 3. He says, a bit is placed in the mouths of, of horses' mouths and the entire body of this very large animal is controlled. How are we going to control? Well, there's, it's a very small thing that's used that actually controls the whole of the body. Let's go further. He, he talks about the rudder on this vast ship. He says there's this very big vessel. This vast ship can be controlled with one small rudder. And the tongue, although small when controlled, has this has this powerful influence on our entire life and person as a disciple. And so we need to control our tongue because if we don't, it can control us. Let's again look at verses 5 through 8. Control your tongue because it's powerful but dangerous. Powerful but dangerous. Let's look here together. Verse 5, James 3, 5. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame to such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and birds of reptiles and Creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race, but no one can tame the tongue. Now he's not saying there's no sense in which we can control it, but he's saying don't think you get to the point where it will never again be a problem for you. The day you think it won't be a problem for you is the day it is a problem for you. You know, it's a lot easier to see, well, it's a problem for somebody else. It's a lot easier for us to say, oh, hey, I know they have a problem with that because of whatever. It's a little harder for us to recognize, you know what, that's not just their problem, I have a problem. We all, he says, look, nobody tames it, but he admonishes us to control it. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil. It's always wanting out of the cage. He says, and is full of deadly poison. It's not that there's no threat there. He says the thing's full of deadly poison. If we allow it to be used in that way. So he says the tongue is a fire. You know, one, you think about that. One small blaze. Think about a forest fire. You think about a forest fire. And how, and this is James' whole illustration. You know, we, we've seen huge, especially, you know, I guess in the West, there's these huge forest fires. And homes are completely destroyed and 
lives sometimes are taken. Many lives can be taken. And, and you think of all of the, just the consequences of that and the funds that go into trying to take care of that and the men and women that, that jeopardize their own lives to save more lives because of this huge blaze and flame. And it starts how? Does it start big? No, it starts small. And as it starts small, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And it becomes a huge issue. Something that was small becomes bigger than really it should have ever been. So one small blaze can set an entire forest and city to destruction. Vast amounts of property and human lives can be caused. And, and what is he saying? He's saying, listen, it ha fire has the ability to multiply and spread quickly. And he says the tongue is a fire. I want to look at several passages in Proverbs. So turn back with me to Proverbs. This is very much like the Proverbs. Turn to Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 28. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse uh, 28. I'll give you the opportunity to, to get there. I'll even take a breath. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 15 and uh, verse 28. As you get there, or at least hear the reading of the Word of God. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 28. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer. But the mouth of the wicked pours out evil Things. How many times have you thought, you know, if I could have just had a little bit more time to think before I spoke, you know, swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Or maybe you're in some context, you're in some situation. But he says that we ought to ponder if we can and work on our heart. The mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. Come, come to Proverbs 16, verse 27. Proverbs 16, all these should be close enough anyway. Proverbs 16, and in verse 27, he says, A worthless man digs up evil. Do you keep a, I mean, in, in 1 Corinthians 13 about love, do we, I mean, I understand it's, it's important to see patterns of behavior, but do I, do I try to like keep a dossier and, and uh, pull out old statements that were said in various contexts so I can use them in some other context. He says here in this passage, Proverbs 16 and verse 27, a worthless man digs up evil while his words are like scorching fire. So James, it's not real, this is a new idea for James. James is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit pulling on these things. Look at chapter 26 of Proverbs. Proverbs uh, 26, and there's a lot in Proverbs we could look at, but Proverbs uh, 26, Proverbs 26 in verse 20. Proverbs 26 and verse 20. For lack of wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no whisper, contention quiets down. Like charcoal to hot embers and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. The words of a whisper are like dainty morsels, and they go down into the innermost parts of the body. And we could look at some other passages. We want to be discerning judges. He, he talks about this earlier on in James. We want to be wise and, and strive to be thoughtful. Now, having said that, it's clear there are circumstances where we can be thoughtful and loving and yet firm and strong. There, you know, there's sometimes is the notion that, well, if there's ever any forthright things said or strong things said, there's times when parents have to say some pretty strong things. They can do so in love and kindness but pretty firm things to their kids. In fact, I would even say if they did not say those firm things, they may not be or would not be parenting as they should be. doesn't mean they're out of control, but they're, they're firm in those things. And so we certainly see that here as, 
as well. So we, we, we don't want to hear selectively and repeat indiscriminately. Let me say that one more time. We don't want to hear selectively and repeat indiscriminately. That leads to a problem, and we're warned of that. What are motivations of gossip, though? It's, it's not necessarily just exchange of information. That would depend on the context. Well, here are some. That you may be able to think about some more that we all want to guard in our own heart and mind, but that I know the Bible would address. Sometimes it's just idleness. You know, 1 Timothy 5 and verse 13 warns of someone who's just, just idle. They don't have anything better to do. And I meant, I meant to, uh, I just didn't put it uh, in my notes. I read a very interesting piece by Brother Dor Moyer the other day. And he kind of did some stuff with James chapter 3. And he changed from the tongue to the fingers <laughs> for um, Facebook. And you make the same kind of application. Just like we have to control our tongue, we may need to work at controlling what we type and what we say in that way. Thoughtlessness. We're to be thinking of one another. It may be just cowardice. It's easier, it's easier to speak to somebody else who may share your feelings than it is to the person with whom you really need to be speaking. Or jealousy and and envy, Corinth was just eaten up with that. Or, or maybe vindictiveness. You remember there were some who were trying to add affliction to the Apostle Paul's bonds. Or, or dishonesty, or just hatred. The enemies of Christ just hated him. Or hypocrisy. We're told to love sincerely. But slander and gossip is a way of, love, of, of professing to love and yet not actually loving one another. And you know, sometimes, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, if you would. Turn to 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, and verse 10. This section talking about Israel and the bad example of Israel. And he talks about immorality of all kinds. But we come to verse 10, he says, you know, he says, don't do this like they did that. Don't do this like they did that. And then he says in verse 10, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Or don't murmur, murmur, complain, uh, grumble. Often what happens with, with backbiting and gossip and slander is discontent. Dissatisfaction of some kind. And so maybe it's insecurities and, and we're trying to compensate for that. And the way we deal with that is we... We slander and we gossip and we backbite. And go back to James now, James chapter 3, and look at verse 6, and look at the potency of the, of the tongue, and notice what he would say to us there. Notice what he says. And this is powerful language. I want you to pick up on, on it with me this morning. Verse 6, so he says, See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. So there's the idea of spread and, and quick spread. And then he says this. He says, And the tongue is a fire. So he says, We know how those forest fires start. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. It's like with James, he, if, if you think of him intensifying, you thought, this is intense, but he just keeps climbing the ladder. So, so notice the passage there again. He starts out by saying it's a, it's, it can cause a great fire. He says the tongue is a fire. Then he says, no, it's the tongue of fire. It's the world of iniquity. Not only is it a world of iniquity, the tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body. And then he says, I'm not going to stop there. It sets on fire the course of our life. He doesn't stop there. He says it's set on fire by hell. It's set on fire by hell. He says it, it defiles everything. It stains everything. It's, it's raging in its consumption. It contaminates everything that is around it. It can pollute the whole of my person. It sets on fire the course of our life. The Greek there is the, the wheel of birth of existence, the hub, the center of everything. And maybe a husband says to his wife things, that cuts so deeply that it takes a long time to heal 
or a wife says things to her husband that cuts extremely deeply, or we say things to each other that cut extremely deeply, and that we know, if we're really honest, there wasn't a shred of truth in that statement. And then he says, is set on fire by hell. That word hell there is Gehenna. Now, just quickly, Gehenna goes back to what happened with Moloch with all those children being sacrificed. The darkest, I mean just the deepest, darkest moment of the history of Israel. It was infamous and there was a a deep stench that arose and the Jews would have had this deep regret and hatred for that historical event and it had become a garbage heap and the fire burned all the time with this sickening stench to such a point that it became the metaphor for eternal punishment in hell. And James, when he talks about the consequences of the tongue, uses that kind of language behind the evil of the tongue is is Satan from the pit of hell and it leads us back to hell. And then look at verses 7 and 8. That restless, deadly poison. There was a uh, statement that I saw uh, in a piece of literature. It said he was a saint abroad and a devil at home. He preached love and gentleness on Sunday, but he snaps with impatience at his family on Monday. It has not been unknown for one to speak with piety and worship, but to curse a group of workers during the week. It has not been unknown for a woman to speak with graciousness at a religious meeting and then to murder one's reputation with a malicious tongue. It is a fire. It is the undercurrent of verbal poison. I think I've shared with you before, but it's always been something that struck me as we think about the idea that controlling our tongue is so important because it could lead us into inconsistency. It doesn't mean if I ever misuse my tongue, I can't repent and be right with the Lord. But if I get used to doing it repeatedly, is there a time to, to, to rebuke? Yeah. Is there a time to reprove? Yes. Is there a time to be forthright in that? Yes. But we need to be cautious and be wise. And again, it's a lot easier for me to see that in somebody else than it is to see it in myself. But there's a story of a family and um, they, they went to worship one morning they went to worship one morning, and as soon as they got in the car, all the way home, Dad is, man, he is just going off about everybody. He didn't like the guy that made the announcements, and he didn't like the way the prayers were done. He didn't like the song leader, and nobody would do that today, Todd, but, but he, did, he didn't like the song leader. He sure didn't like the preacher's sermon. He didn't like anything that happened that whole day, all the way home. Going, I know that would never happen, but this is as the story goes. So, all the way home, you know, he's talking. And they get home, and lunch isn't ready yet. Mom's working on lunch, and so he just keeps, keeps going. And then finally, the mother says, Hey, it's time for lunch, Sunday lunch. And they all come to the table, and they all sit down. And as they're sitting there, Dad says, Well, I'll say a prayer. And he says, The most beautiful prayer. And his six-year-old little boy with big brown eyes looks up at his daddy. He says, Daddy, he said, did did God hear you when you were doing all that complaining? And he kind of ducks his head and he says, yeah, son, I suppose he did. He said, well, I got another question. Did, Did he hear you when you did that praying? And he said, yeah, son, I suppose he did. He said, which one did he believe? Now that's somewhat humorous, but it's very convicting. So we all have things we have to work on, but let's not do damage to the potential for our families to see Christ in us 
because we were just careless with a member that can be full of deadly poison or it can be full of the gospel of Christ. You've listened very well today, and I appreciate your good attention. If you're not a Christian, the word of God invites you, come now and obey the gospel, believing in Christ, repenting of your sins and confessing your faith and being immersed in water for the remission of your sins. Come now, as together we stand and we sing.